Shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret again. And I want to welcome you to this first session in our four-part series of podcasts that I'm entitling The Archaeology of Passover. Our goal is again to study the Passover in its historical and cultural context. In this session, we're going to discuss the possible reality that Jesus actually rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday. In other words, the first Palm Sunday. But as we do this, it'll challenge our notions of doctrine versus tradition. It'll challenge us to consider the very words of God or the very words of men. In session two, I call it the Palm and the Lamb. We have to ask our sells the question, why this Sunday? Why didn't he come in on the Sabbath? Why didn't he come in on Monday? Is there something we can't see? <laughs> wow. That's all I got to say. Just wait. In session three, I call that one bread and rams. And in session three, we're going to ask the question, what's the Last Supper got to do with the Jewish Seder? On top of that, what does the Jewish Seder have to do with Egypt? Because really the Passover meal is established in Exodus chapter 12 and it's all related to God's saving his people from slavery and the bondage of Egypt. There's some amazing, amazing connections that we'll take a look at all the way from Egypt all the way to the cross. And finally in session four, I entitled it Sunday the Empty Tomb. And from an archaeological point of view, we're going to talk about Jesus' tomb. What was it like? Was it like the garden tomb? Many of you perhaps have been in Israel and have seen the garden tomb. What was Jesus' tomb like? But again, we're going to ask ourselves the question, why did Jesus rise on this Sunday? Why didn't he rise on the Jewish Sabbath? The Sabbath is like the most holy day of the week. You'd say, why didn't he do that? And the reasons, you guys, definitely will blow you away. So are you ready? Are you ready to join me in these podcasts, these next four, in terms of this series between now and next week? Are you sure? Now come, this is the way. As we walk in the dust of Rabbi Jesus, and we listen to his words, that he is the way and the truth and the life. So we walk in him. Let's go. So as we enter the Passover season, for many Christians, Palm Sunday is a major event marking this time. Now, Palm Sunday, we know, is a remembrance of Jesus' entering Jerusalem days before his death and resurrection. As he rides in, the crowd see him, and they cut down palm branches. In Matthew's Gospel, they take the palm branches, lay them on the ground before Jesus as he's riding in on the uh, colt. They also take off their cloaks as well. Perhaps many also were waving them as he passed by. Now they cried out, they are actually using words from Psalm 118, verses 19 through 26, and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the observance of Palm Sunday itself, oh boy, it seems like a tradition. The earliest documented source that we have regarding Palm Sunday is from the 4th century, and it's described in the ancient work that's called the pilgrimage pilgrimage of Etheria. It's also she's also known Etheria is also known as Egeria. She is a woman, probably a native of Spain or even Gaul, which is southern France. Probably very wealthy, probably a woman of leisure, and this whole pilgrimage of Etheria is her notes and her diary of a three-year journey that she made to Egypt, Israel, and Syria. Here's what she wrote. This is the earliest description of Palm Sunday. So this is again from the pilgrimage of Etheria, dated to the 4th century AD. Quote, 
As the eleventh hour approaches, the passage from the gospel is read, where the children, carrying branches and palms, met the Lord, saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the bishop immediately rises, and all the people with him, and they go on foot from the top, top of the Mount of Olives, all the people going before him with hymns and uh, antiphons answering one to another. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And all the children in the neighborhood, even those who are too young to walk, are carried by their parents on their shoulders, all of them bearing branches, some of palms and some of olives. And the, the bishop is escorted in the same manner as the Lord of old. Amazing. The earliest, you might say, liturgical source is from the 8th century called the Bobbio Missal. And in there, like I said, that is from the Middle Ages, and there actually is the liturgical prescription for Palm Sunday. But the question is, is Palm Sunday a remembrance of Jesus entering Jerusalem actually on a Sunday? Now, the earliest evidence that we have of Palm Sunday goes back to the 4th century. We have nothing before that. Or... Is it simply an old church tradition? Now, we know the church has many traditions. Lent is one of those, for instance. The early Christians used to pray and fast before Passover. And finally, at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, it was formalized as an actual church, you might say, holy day. So men, godly men, yes, godly men, made up Lent. This is, this is a tradition didn't happen in Jesus' day. And Palm Sunday definitely is a liturgical holy day remembering Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But what I want to suggest is that Jesus actually rode in on a Sunday. He actually rode in on the first day of the week. Let's check this out. Now the Gospel of John gives us some concrete facts. I'm in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, reading from the New American Standard Bible. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. So Jesus comes to Bethany six days before the Passover. Now let's put this text back into its historical context. Now in Jesus' day, Passover was a special, unique day. We need to establish this. I'm going to Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8, which describes Passover as a separate, unique day. Let's take a look at this again, uh, Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8. These are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Then on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So Passover is Nisan 14. It's separate from the first day of unleavened bread, or the, the feast of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is on Nisan 15. Remember, the biblical calendar is a lunar calendar. We're dealing with the, we're dealing with the biblical calendar in Jesus' day, not our calendar, not the way the Romans actually kept time with regards to their calendar. So the month of Passover is called Nisan. Uh, that's basically March or April on our calendar. And each month starts at a new moon. So Nisan 14 is 14 days after the new moon. Thus, Nisan 14. So... Nisan 15 is the next day, and each day starts at sundown. So Nisan 15 starts at sundown on Nisan 14. Uh, this Let's use our current week to give us a good example. So let's say uh, we want to apply it to our day, and we're using the biblical calendar, and we come to Friday. 
And so our normal Friday uh, goes from midnight to midnight, but on the biblical calendar, it would go from sundown to sundown. So if we're using the biblical calendar on our Friday, that means at sundown on Friday, Saturday would start. And then Saturday would go through until sundown Saturday, then Sunday would start. And then Sunday would go for 24 hours, and at Sunday sundown, Monday would start, etc. So that's why Jewish people start their Sabbath at sundown on Friday night, because they're using the biblical way of telling time to actually do the Sabbath. Nisan 15 is 15 days from a new moon, and it just so happens 15 days from a new moon, two weeks after the new moon is a full moon, so there's a full moon on Nisan 15, and this is a, a, a great way to tell when Passover would be in a specific year. When is that full moon during Nisan? Once it gets dark, after sundown on the 14th, Nisan 15 starts, and that's when they will have their Passover dinner. Now, I'm going to bring this up later because it's going to be critical in a later lesson. So not in this lesson, but in a later lesson it will be critical. Now, today in Judaism, Passover means Nisan 14, Passover, as it says in Leviticus 23, and Nisan 15, the first day of unleavened bread, and the six days of the feast. So it's not only Nisan 14, but all seven days of the feast. But in Jesus' day, Passover is the day before the feast of unleavened bread. It's a unique, special day. So don't get that confused to how it is known today or uh, the terminology of today. The next thing. Jesus is a practicing Jew. We need to take a look at this. What is the evidence that suggests that Jesus is doing the customs of a normal religious Jewish man? Well, number one, there's no criticism of Yeshua not adhering to the customs and the laws of the Second Temple Judaism. Oh, there was a debate in Jesus' day whether you could heal on the Sabbath. It was a debate. There were some Pharisees that said yes, others said no. But what did Jesus do? He healed on the Sabbath. So it's clear where Jesus stood in terms of the question, can you heal somebody on the Sabbath? Jesus never violated any of the Jewish customs or the practices. And on top of that, we know that Jesus is without sin. He wore tassels like the other religious Jewish men. You remember the woman with the bleeding disease. Your Bible says that that woman touched his fringe. But once again... We've got to take the English to the Greek, the Greek to the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, the translation of the Old Testament into Hebrew. So therefore, we can find the Hebrew word that the Greek word translates. And we, when we do that, we find the word tzitzit, which, which is the tassels on the corners of the outer cloak of a religious Jewish man in Jesus' day. Jesus wore tzitzit, or tzitziot according to Numbers 15 in 37 through 41. I won't read that. So he, wear, he wore tassels, just like other religious Jewish men of his day. He attended synagogue on the Sabbath. In Luke 4, in verse 16, it says, as was his custom, he attended the synagogue. The Greek word there is ito, and from Thayer's Greek lexicon, the better way of saying it was as he was wont to do. In other words, uh, as a religious Jewish man, uh, this was what he was accustomed to and expected to do. So indeed, Jesus did the Sabbath according to the Jewish tradition. Now, in Jesus' day, the customs and practices are to bless God, bless God before a meal. Now, when you actually read about the feeding of the 5,000, your Bible says he blessed the food. Uh, no, he didn't. Because if you actually look there very carefully, the word food was mistakenly added because Christians thought Jesus blessed food. No Jew blesses food. They always bless God. And so again, that shows that our translators have been disconnected from those ancient customs and cultures. He's a practicing religion Jew. I mean, this is, this is over and over and over again. Now, as a practicing religious Jew, 
How far can you walk on the Sabbath? Now, in Jesus' day, it was restricted to a Sabbath day's journey, which was about 2,000 cubits, roughly about 3,000 feet, or about two-thirds of a mile. Now, on Palm Sunday, when you take all four Gospels together, we know that Jesus is coming from Jericho, and he's coming to Bethel, Bethany. This is about 15 miles. So, Jesus can only walk a mile on the Sabbath. Again, the, the New Testament clearly shows that Jesus is a practicing religious Jewish man. So, if Jesus arrives on Bethany, to Bethany on Friday, and he served dinner, and it's on a Friday, that means dinner normally is going to be in the evening, either before sundown, perhaps after sundown, but since he comes on a Friday, and Friday sundown is the Sabbath, and since Jewish people always have a big meal on the evening of the Sabbath, in other words, after the sun goes down on Friday, this implies from the Jewish culture that the meal that he has is the Sabbath evening meal, so he's eating on Saturday. Now, considering the Sabbath, we go back into John chapter 12, 1 through 2. We know he arrives there six days before Passover, but... In verses 12 and 13, it says, On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So, if he's having his meal, and it's the Sabbath meal, because it's, again, that's the meal that they're going to have that night, if he arrives on Friday. When it says the next day, the next day after the Sabbath is Sunday. So again, the Bible in context is clear that he would ride in to Jerusalem on Sunday if he arrived before sundown on Friday. So the question becomes, did he arrive on Friday? What about Thursday? What about Wednesday? It can't be Sunday. He can't arrive in Bethany on Sunday and then have a meal and then on the next day. Because if he did that, there would be no Palm Sunday if Jesus actually rode in on the Sunday. The key here is, if he arrives on Friday in Bethany, has his Sabbath dinner, and on the next day, which would be a Sunday, rode into Jerusalem, the key here is, did he arrive on Friday? And so again, the key is that statement, he arrived in Bethany six days before, Pass, uh, before Passover. Now remember, it's Passover, not the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover is Nisan 14. It's the day the lambs are sacrificed for the Passover meal. Not the first day of Unleavened Bread, where they ate the Passover meal, that today is called the Seder. Now remember, what we're reading about is not like today. In contemporary Judaism, Passover means Nisan 14 and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's eight days. Also, that's key, Jesus is crucified on the day, on Passover, on Nisan 14, on the day the lambs are sacrificed. Now, for clarity's sake, Let's consider the phrase six days before Passover. Let's say you are to attend a July 4th party. And this party is in a town far away. And let's assume that this July 4th party is going to be on a Friday. And let's say you arrive on Friday. So you arrived on the day, on July 4th. You made it. You're not a day before. You're on the day. But if you arrived on Thursday, people would say, oh, you arrived the day before the party. You arrived one day before July 4th. If you arrived on Wednesday, it'd be two days before. Tuesday, it'd be three days before, and so on. So indeed, if you arrived in town six days before July 4th, which was on a Friday, 
you can go all the way back. Thursday would be one day before. Wednesday would be two days before. Tuesday, three days. Monday, four days. Sunday, five days. And Saturday would be six days before. So if you arrive in town on Saturday before July 4th, which happens to be on a Friday, you have arrived six days before that Friday, six days before July 4th. Now, one thing I want to do is, as before we continue, I want to take a side trip here because I want to address something. And the issue is doctrine versus tradition. Now, most Christian denominations have a statement of faith and most simply state the typical doctrine about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. He's born of a virgin, born of a virgin Mary, suffered, he was, he was crucified and suffered under Pontius Pilate, who's died and buried, and he rose on the third day. And in many cases, the doctrine of most denominations make no mention of December 25th and make no mention of Good Friday. Good Friday, in most denominations, is a church tradition and not doctrine. Doctrine is a set of beliefs and or principles held and taught by the church. In most cases, for instance, you could be asked to leave a denomination if you have, if you have actually come against a doctrinal issue. In many Christian uh, churches today, in many Christian denominations, they celebrate Christmas on December 25th. And most Christians today understand that it's only a tradition and not doctrine. We've had too much historical evidence to show that the early Roman church actually made up the date. And it was likely that they did that to actually go against the pagan holiday, the huge pagan holiday, on the winter solstice Saturnalia in the Roman Empire. Now, I believe this is the same for the church tradition of saying Jesus died on a, fri fr on a Friday. It's probably based on the Roman disconnect to Christianity's roots in Jerusalem. Those Roman Christians, Greek Christians, by that time, probably 2nd century, 3rd century AD, there were mostly Gentiles now, many of the Jews who were messianic, were not even part of it anymore. So those Romans and Greeks, formerly pagans, but now in the faith as Christians, they probably understood Sabbath uh, as only Saturday. Problem is, the Pharisees believed that the first day and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread were Sabbaths. Matter of fact, many of the feasts, the Pharisees said they were Sabbaths, but the Bible doesn't say that. The rabbis are making it up because you can still light a fire on the first day of unleavened bread. You can still light a fire on the seventh day, but you cannot light a fire on the Sabbath or you will die. So it cannot be a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath-like day because you're not supposed to do any work, but it's not a Sabbath. So it's easy to see how the church assumed that Jesus died on a Friday because the next day is Sabbath, Saturday. However, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, from a pharisaical point of view, in Jesus' day was also a Sabbath. Now, if it's Friday, if Jesus died on a Friday, and if John 12, verses 1 through 2 is true, that, in other words, Jesus arrived six days before Passover in Bethany, Bethany, and we're saying that the Passover is Friday, six days before is Saturday. It's very, very probable that Jesus is a practicing religious Jew. If so, Jesus can only travel about a mile on Saturday, the Sabbath. If Jesus dies on Good Friday, it contradicts the extreme likelihood that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Sunday, on Palm Sunday. Let's consider two years, 30 AD and 33 AD. 33 AD, and you can check this out scientifically, 
Passover's on a Friday, so the first day of unleavened bread is going to be at sundown on that Friday, which means that what we would call Friday night, actually a Saturday night for the Jewish people then, there would be a full moon. It would be the start of the feast, and also the start of the weekly Sabbath. It would be a double one. Remember, the Pharisees considered it a Sabbath, which it wasn't. But in Jesus' day, they taught that you had a double Sabbath on day. Now, the next year, and the only year, that fits in terms of all of the events of the Passover is 30, 30 AD. Now there, Passover is on a Thursday, which means the full moon would have been on that, what we would call Thursday night, actually Friday night. But with regards to John 12, verses 1 through 2, if he arrives in Bethany six days before Passover, he arrived on Friday. On top of that, if he arrives on Friday in Bethany and we're dealing with the Jewish culture of 2,000 years ago, he rode in Jerusalem on Sunday. It was the first Palm Sunday. Now there's more biblical evidence that supports 30 AD. I want to go to John chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now here's the important verse. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple. How will you raise it up in three days? So again, that statement is further biblical and historical proof that 30 AD is the likely year that Jesus was crucified. Herod starts building the temple, remodeling the temple, actually in a 20 to, uh, 20 to 19 BC. Now, 19 BC, you would say, okay, that's 19 years before Christ. There is no year zero. And then 1 AD to 27 AD is 27 years. 19 plus 27 is 46 years. So we're reading these verses where Jesus talks about destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He says this in 27 AD. These are the very words of God. Now this can't be the last year of his life or he'd be, he'd be crucified in 27 AD. So it can't be the last year. Now we assume that this is probably the beginning of his ministry. And we again assume that his ministry lasted for three years. So if he's saying this in 27 AD, it's the beginning of John's gospel. And if indeed it's true that Jesus' ministry lasted for about three years, what year did he die? 30 AD. Now let's go to Matthew 12, 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, these are the very words of God, not men. This is not opinion. This is not speculation. This is not assumption. These are God's precise words. Jesus will be in the grave three days and three nights. Now, let's take a look at this. Let's say he dies on Friday. So, 
we got a few hours before sundown, so he dies on Friday. Let's consider that day one. Saturday starts at sundown. That's the start of day two. And Jesus is in the grave overnight. So we've got day one. We've got the start of day two. He's there overnight, which is night one. And he's in the grave the rest of Saturday till sundown. So at sundown on Saturday, we've got two days and one night. Sunday starts at sundown on Saturday. So we've got the third day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And he's in the grave after sundown on day three. And he rises from the dead, perhaps before dawn on Sunday, which is night number two. Problem? There's no night number three. But God said, not men, he'd be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So what about if Jesus died on Thursday? Now Thursday, a slightly different way of looking at it. Thursday from 3 p.m. Thursday to Friday 3 p.m. is one day and one night. Friday 3 p.m. to Saturday 3 p.m. is one day and one night. Saturday 3 p.m. to Sunday dawn, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., would be considered another day with a third night. The result is three days and three nights. This supports God's word, not someone's opinion. And what year is it? 30 AD. Now we put the word of God into its historical context, and it's probably more probable that Jesus dies on a Thursday in 30 AD. One, it supports Jesus' words. It agrees with the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. It does not conflict with church doctrine. But like December 25th at Christmas, we challenge only tradition and not belief. That's one aspect of Palm Sunday. And I agree some will still argue for Good Friday. Some may argue for Wednesday. But no matter, the doctrine doesn't change. The doctrine doesn't change of the Lutheran Church denominations, of the Baptist denominations, of the Christian Missionary Alliance denominations, of the Assembly of God denominations, of Messianic um, congregations. As God saved his people by his grace from slavery and the bondage of Egypt, so too he came. Jesus came, born of a virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. And on the third day, he arose from the dead, and he, and he ascended to his Father. And he gave all mankind, if they so choose Jesus, as Lord and Savior, forgiveness of their sins and life eternal with him. So indeed, 30 AD does not challenge doctrine challenges church tradition. However, 30 AD also is more appropriate to the accuracy of the Bible. Showing God's word is precise and true. So we'll be coming into session number two. And in session number two, the title is called The Palm Branch and the Lamb of God. Because we have to ask ourselves the question, if indeed Jesus comes in on a Sunday, why that Sunday? Why didn't he come in on Monday? Why didn't he come on the Sabbath? He's God. Wait till we take a look. Amazing things to see in the fact that Jesus rode in on that Sunday. So I'll see you in session two that's entitled Palm Branch and the Lamb of God. Shalom.